things like that. And just stay on the verses, because going to the that bridge is too difficult unless we're all together. Too easy. Good morning. How are you? So during scripture. And for the scripture and stuff like that. So why don't we, after that, switch to goodness of God. Do verse 1 and chorus over and over again. Everybody feel it? Do we? After holy desire, we're going to switch to goodness of God for verse 1 and chorus over and over again. Well, and for scripture and, and prayer. Switching to goodness of God. First one, chorus over and over. Too easy. Bam. Yeah. Good morning, Antioch Church. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to everyone tuning in online. Let's get let's stand to our feet and sing hymn number 165. Amazing Grace. 330. We are having Awana Youth and A-Teams today following the second service, so please stay for that. 
Church directories are now available. If you would like an updated directory, just email or call the church office and you can get one of those to have and to reach out to your church family. If you would like some Antioch merch, please reach out to the church office or contact Nikki Browning to order. It's good looking, it's warm, it's perfect for this time of year. So get yours while supplies last. We are gearing up for our Hope for Appalachia missions trip. We are going back to Kentucky. We're gonna be going there March 25th through the 29th. If you would like to be a member of the missions team that goes, please contact the church office. We can get you your application. You can start filling that out. If you can't go, you can still pack a box. We're hoping to pack over 300 boxes. The information for that is on these blue tables in the back. You get those six quart Sterilite containers and load them up with love, amen. We're collecting those boxes until the end of February. So get yours and fill them up and bring them in. And we're going to line the front, pray over them, and send them on their way. We are having a called business meeting Wednesday, January the 31st. So if you're a member, we encourage you to attend. Ladies, Bible studies have started back up. You can be here Thursday morning in the worship center. They're studying Psalm 23. Or Thursday evenings at Nancy Kidd's house, they're studying the book of Amos. So there's lots of opportunities for the ladies to get involved. Amen. Amen. Today is Sanctity of Life Sunday, and I want to remind Antioch Baptist Church, and before I do that, I want to wish Pastor Jenny a happy birthday. Can we do that? Say happy birthday. This is for you. Come on up here. I just looked down and saw happy birthday, Pastor Jenny. Don't we love our youth pastor? Pretty sure you got some flowers in the kitchen as well. So you get those at your leisure. Amen. Anyway, like I was saying, today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. We're doing baby and child dedications today at both of our services. How many of you know the Bible says, and this is our theme verse for Antioch Christian Academy, that children are a heritage from the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I want you to know you're in a church that believes in the sanctity of life. We believe that God is the author of all life. And we advocate and we fight for the lives of the unborn for those that are that are in need of adoption and in need of foster care. That's the kind of church that you're sitting in this morning. So I can't think of a better dedicate children to the Lord. And I'm going to ask Justin and Jesse Crenshaw's if they would come and bring their precious daughter, Amelia Ann, if the family members want to come with them at this time, they can. We're celebrating Amelia's life this morning and we're dedicating her back to God. Just like he did in 1 Samuel chapter 1, Y'all turn and face the congregation. What a lovely family. Isn't, this, isn't it beautiful to see our church growing in every way, including the old-fashioned way? Come on, somebody. 1 Samuel 1, 27 through 28, Hannah prayed to God, and she said, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him back to the Lord. His life will be dedicated to God. Just like Hannah, we celebrate by giving Amelia's life back to the Lord. Mary and Joseph brought Jesus into the temple to be dedicated and in the same way. there. And when we do that, we're making an acknowledgement that, that, that this child was God's before it was ours. And we're offering back to him as a gift. We're returning that gift to him. And we're, in, we're, we're going to dedicate our lives to Ephesians 6, 4. It says that we're going to bring our children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, Justin and Jesse, I want you to turn and face me for just a moment. This is not just a ceremony, it's a commitment. There's nothing magical in and of this moment. This is a recognition of God's gift. It's a commitment on your part that you and your family are going to serve the Lord, that you all are going to stay married, Justin, that you're going to love your wife the way Christ loved the church, and you're going to follow your husband's instruction, and these girls are going to honor and obey their parents, praise God, and all of you are going to serve and love God together. I'm going to ask you to make some commitments in front of your church family this morning. And if you agree and intend to keep these promises, simply answer with, we do. Do you here this day recognize your child as a gift from God and give heartfelt thanks for God's blessing? Do you here this day dedicate your child to the Lord who gave, who gave her to you? Do you this day pledge as parents that you will bring your t- bring Amelia up in the training and instruction of the Lord? Do you this day, they're saying we do, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Do you hear this day promise your child to give Amelia every possible benefit of home, of school, and of church? Do you this day pledge to pray that God would prosper and bless her as she grows and develops? Do you promise to set a Christian example for her as she grows up? 
And do you promise to do everything in your power to direct Amelia to a personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ? Y'all can turn and face the congregation. Congregation, I'm going to give a charge to you as well. Would you stand as a demonstration of our commitment to pray and to teach and to train and to love on this family? Antioch Baptist Church, do you commit to love this family with the love of Christ? Praise God. Let's stretch forth your hand and let's pray a blessing over Amelia and her parents and her family. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you that you are the God of all life, that you are the giver of all life. Lord, we praise you for the Crenshaw family and the way that they love you and trust you. Lord, we pray your protection over them. We pray your provision over them. We pray, oh God, that they will feel your love and that they will feel our love. We pray for every opportunity that we get to teach them in children's church, in Sunday school, and in Awana, every interaction that we have. Lord, we just pray that our words would be seasoned with salt, that we will be lifting and edifying and building up and setting a good example ourselves, knowing that at all times there's someone watching. Lord, we just ask that you would bless this family, bless these children, and bless sweet Amelia. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You guys can be seated. Congregation, stay standing as we worship the Lord this morning. You call 
Lord, it's a blessing to be here. Let's just thank you for everything that you've given. Uh, be with Dave today. Give him the words we need to hear, Lord. Open our hearts and soften them. Like Dave said this morning, Lord, just thank you for all the babies that are coming in here. Growing the church, though, for me. Lord, bless this offering this morning, Lord. We love you and praise your name. Amen. sing this as a unified prayer.
burn the holy fire for you. Lord, no counterfeit, no nothing strange or unauthorized, no half-heartedness, no just going through the motions. Lord, we want to burn with a holy fire so the world can see. Lord, our God is a consuming fire. You're calling all of us to offer our bodies, our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. Lord, we know that, Lord, you've called us to be your people, to call on your name. And Lord, we seek your face and we repent of our sins and we ask for you to heal our country. We ask for you to heal our land, for our county, for our community, for our country. Lord, we need an outpouring of your spirit. I just pray you stir up a hunger within your people for it. Lord, I I believe the only reason we don't have revival is because we're content to live without it for far too long. We're okay with just showing up when we can. But Lord, you want to captivate our hearts and captivate our thoughts and captivate our wills. Lord, you want us to be a living, burning bush for people to look and see, wow, that must be something to that God, to that Jesus that they're always talking about because it looks like their lives are consumed by him. Lord, we just pray that you accept our offering, the praise of our lips. Lord, that they won't come from double-tongued, that they won't come from double-minded people. Lord, that we'll be wholly set apart for you. Hallelujah. We're in Leviticus chapter 10 this morning, verses 1 through 11. God's word says, Leviticus chapter 10, starting at verse 1, Aaron's sons, now you have to understand these were priests, these were the Levites, those authorized to offer sacrifices for the pe- on behalf of the people to God, Aaron and his sons, Nadab and Abihu. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, each took his own fire pan, put fire in it, placed incense on it, and then presented unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them to do. Then fire came from the Lord and burned them to death before the Lord. Can you imagine being in church on that day? Verse 3, so Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant. When he said, I will show my holiness to those who are near me, and I will reveal my glory before all the people. But Aaron remained silent. And Moses summoned Mishael and and Elzaphan, the sons of Aaron's uncle, Uziel, and said to them, come here and carry your relatives away from the front of the sanctuary to a place outside the camp. So when they came forward and carried them in their tunics outside the camp, as Moses had said, and then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, do not let your hair hang loose, do not tear your garments, or else you will die, and the Lord will become angry with the whole community. However, your brothers, the house of Israel, may mourn over the tragedy when the Lord sent the fire. You must go outside the entrance of the tent. You must not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting, or you will die. For the Lord's anointing oil is on you. So they did as Moses said. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, You and your sons are not to drink wine or beer when you enter the tent of meeting, or else you will die. This is a permanent statute throughout your generations. You must distinguish between the holy and the common, and the the clean and the unclean, and teach the Israelites all the statutes that the Lord has given to them through Moses. Let's pray. Lord, we just praise you and thank you that Jesus, the perfect high priest, went to the cross for all of us to make us a holy priesthood unto our God. So now all of us, Lord, redeemed, sprinkled by the blood of the Lamb and anointed with the oil of the Holy Spirit, sealed for the day of redemption. Lord, now we are your holy people set apart for you. And we're so thankful for that amazing grace and your amazing mercy. So we can confess our sins and, and you, don't, you, you don't give us immediate judgment. You offer mercy and eternal life through Jesus Christ. We're, so thankful for the, we're thankful for the age of grace that we're, Lord, we take for granted so often. But remind us that we are to be holy even as you are holy. And set that holy fire in our hearts. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you can be seated. We're in our series, The Whole Counsel of God. We're going from Genesis to Revelation week by week. Last week we were in Exodus. This morning we find ourselves in the book of Leviticus. And just a quick recap from Mount Sinai, Exodus 32, all the way to this morning. You know, you have to remember that God came down on the mountain to enter into a covenant of love with the people of Israel. That's why he saved them and redeemed them and brought them out of Egypt was to enter into a covenant of love with them, just like he did with Noah and just like with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But as we saw last week, God's people behaved badly and they broke the covenant. They built a golden calf and called it Yahweh and worshiped it and thanked it for delivering them from Egypt. And this made God angry. This made God want to enact judgment on the people. He tells Moses, go down and, and sort your people out. So Moses goes down the mountain. He, he has the Ten Commandments in his hands. He throws and shatters the Ten Commandments. Then he melts down the golden calf, crushes it into a powder, makes the people drink it. Then he and the Levites purge the rest of the sin from the camp. Moses goes and intercedes for the people. God tells him to go back up to the mountain. And then Moses has to rewrite the Ten Commandments because he shouldn't have broke them in the first place. The Bible says, be angry and do not sin. Being angry is natural. Come on, somebody. Being angry and not sinning is supernatural. Praise God. So God gives Moses all of the covenant obligations and all of the commandments for the Sabbath, and all of the instructions for the tabernacle. The tabernacle was going to be the place where God dwelt among the people, and God traveled with the people. And every, all the nations around Israel would know that Yahweh was the one true God. He was dwelling in the midst of them. They build the tabernacle. They make all the holy instruments for the altars and for the lampstands and for the priestly garments. They set it up and they sprinkle They sprinkle everything with the blood from the burnt offering and then they anoint everything with, with the special anointing oil. That's a, that's a symbol of our salvation. We're, when we're forgiven, we're sprinkled by the blood of the Lamb and our sins are washed clean and we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. Amen. Amen. After all of that, God's glory comes and fills the tabernacle and they lived happily ever after as the worship team comes. No, I'm just kidding. Not! That's not what happens. Boy, wouldn't it be great if that was the end of the story? Amen. That's not what happens. That brings us to Leviticus. Now, I know, listen, for those of you that are reading through the Bible with us and you're reading a book of the Bible every week, Leviticus is hard, right? It can be tough. It can be tough to get through all the, diff the different offerings and all the different rules and regulations. I mean... It is, it, you have to be deep, a deeply spiritual Christian to enjoy Leviticus for a whole week. Amen. But I want you to think about this. If God doesn't give us Leviticus, we do not get the rest of the Bible. If we do not have, it's so important for us to understand, if we don't have Leviticus, then we don't get the nation of Israel. God gives them Leviticus so that they can remain in covenant with him until Christ comes to bring in the second covenant. God is holy. Your God is holy. That means that he is set apart. It means that he is completely other. God is. God is the personification of purity and perfection. And that's good news. Amen. Amen. The bad news is, is that we are not. We are common. We're impure. We're unclean. And we're imperfect. So, so how, do it, how does an impure, unclean, imperfect people have a renewed covenant with a holy God. That's why you have Leviticus. That's how they did it. God tells his people to be holy as I am holy. Now this is completely impossible without God making it possible. It is impossible for us. And now God is so very patient and so merciful. And while his people are going back and forth and serving other gods and serving other idols, he puts the festivals and the sacrifices in place so that they can temporarily atone for their sin. That's why our text this morning is so important and it's so dramatic. Unholy people do not know how to worship a holy God. Case in point would be last week's sermon. Exodus 32. God tells them, and in typical Israelite fashion, as soon as they get the instructions, they break the commandment. Sounds like the story of some of our lives, doesn't it? The minute we are told or warned or instructed, do not touch that. What's the next thing you do? Ah, must touch that. Don't. Why? Because we're sinful and we're rebellious and our hearts are turned away. Our hearts are turned to evil. God inaugurates the priests in Leviticus chapter 8 and chapter 9. And God gives them a 
exact instructions. And at the end of chapter 9, Aaron blesses the people and they offered the sin offering and the burnt offering and the fellowship offering to the Lord on behalf of the people. God accepted the sacrifice and it says that the fire came out from the altar and consumed the burnt offering. And all the people were in awe and they were worshiping God. And then in Leviticus chapter 10, we see two guys, Aaron's sons, who they want that experience again. The problem is, is they wanted it their way instead of God's way. God's people this morning, listen to me, you are in a very dangerous place whenever you put your preferences in front of God's presence. I want to worship God. I want to experience this. I want to have this type of manifestation. Listen, you have to worship God's way or don't worship Him at all. They went seeking after that. Now, spoiler alert, Fast forward from Leviticus to Romans chapter 12. You are supposed to live as the living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. We are to be consumed by Him. We are to be filled by Him. We are to be baptized with the Spirit's fire. We are to be living, walking, worship instruments to the Lord our God every day of our life. But Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, go in and offer strange fire to the Lord. Now the fire of God still came out, but it didn't burn their offering, it burnt them. Why? Well, first of all, everything that they did was wrong. To begin with, they were the wrong people who were handling incense. You can go back and read it in Exodus chapter 30. That was the task of the high priest. He was supposed to offer the incense to God. They used the wrong instruments. They used their own fire pans instead of the censer of the high priest that was sanctified by the special anointing oil. That's, that's Exodus 40 verse 9. They acted at the wrong time. It was only supposed to be offered on the day of atonement. That's when the high priest took the incense into the Holy of Holies. And the incense in the Old Testament is a picture of our prayers. The book of Revelation tells us that the incense is thrown to the fire of God. It represents the prayers and the worship of all the saints. But they offered it at the wrong time. They were under the wrong authority. They did not follow the commandment of the Lord their God. When you do things your own way, in your own time, it will mess up. And you shouldn't be so surprised every time it breaks down. Why is this breaking down? Well, you're doing it at the wrong time, in the wrong way, with the wrong instruments, under the wrong authority. You're not acting in submission to the Holy Spirit. And in burning the incense, they used the wrong fire. Scripture calls it strange, strange fire, or unauthorized fire. And the high priest was commanded to burn the incense on coal, only coals that were taken from the brazen altar. But Nadab and Abihu supplied their own fire, and God rejected it. Lastly, they acted with the wrong motive. They didn't seek to glorify God. And they may have been drunk, which is why we get verses 8 and 9, where God says, listen, when you come into my presence, don't drink beer or wine. Be sober. How many scriptures tell us to live soberly? Amen. It's not condemning wine or beer altogether, but it's saying, look, when you come before me, you need to come before me with a sober attitude and a sober mind and a sober heart. So how do we offer holy fire? I, I, I see three ways in this passage, and gosh, this is just scratching the surface, but it's what I can give you in the amount of time that I know you'll listen. And the amount of time that I'll stay focused, amen. You know, y'all know how ADHD I am. How do we offer holy fire? How do we offer genuine worship? Well, first of all, it has to be according to God's word. Secondly, it has to be abiding in the spirit, the Holy Spirit. And lastly, it has to be applying the truth, Apl according to God's word. God fulfilled his word. Moses says, hey, Aaron, if you didn't know, this is what God meant when he said, I will show my holiness to those who are near me and I will reveal my glory before all the people. Now I'm sure Aaron as a grieving father didn't want to hear the truth at that moment, but the truth still is the truth even when the truth hurts. And the truth still applies even when you don't want to hear it or you don't think you're in a place to receive it. God's truth is applicable at all times and in all ways and in every area and portion of our life. And we have to worship. And Aaron is not even allowed to mourn. His uncle's sons, his nephews have to come and get his dead son's body and carry it outside the camp. Why? Because, well, he had been anointed with the special anointing oil. He was set apart to worship God, and he could not leave. If he would have left, God would have consumed him too. Man, isn't anybody else happy for that amazing grace? Man, how sweet the sound. Ain't none of us would be here. All of, all, all of y'all would have died in the desert. Every one of us. Me, I might have been the first one dead. We have to worship God according to his word. If, if you see a, a, a practice or a form of worship, and it's not 
outlined in the Word of God, don't participate. Don't do it. God has told us exactly how to worship Him. Why do we sing? Why do, we, why, some, why do some of us dance? Why do we pray? Well, because that's what God's Word tells us to do before the Lord. We worship according to His Word. And, and God is serious about His Word. Jesus told us in John 14, If anyone loves me, if anyone loves me, they will keep my word. You say, I love Jesus. And then you continue in unrepented sin. You are a liar. And the truth is not in you. That goes for all of us. God has, has been very specific. But the, pro, the promise is this. My Father will love him and we will come to them and we will make our home with them. Man, what a blessing it is when we worship God according to his word. Man, God has been very specific about how and about when and about who. God tells us now, praise God in the New Testament. Well, when I'm, I don't know when I'm supposed to pray. It's easy. Pray always. Well, I just don't know how to pray. It's easy. Our Father, who art in heaven, he tells you, he, he's given us so much. It's amazing how willing we are to ignore all the knowledge we have, and our excuse will be, well, I just don't know this little part. Well, we'll practice what you know, and then you will continue to grow. Amen. Whenever we try to add to or embellish worship with our own means, it does not glorify God. Nadab and Abihu brought their own fire pans. They wanted to do it their way. In other words, they could have been saying, if we don't sing this hymn or if we don't do this song at this tempo, well, I'm just not going to worship. Okay, Nadab, nice to meet you. Man, got quiet in here on that. My way is not God's way. Amen? How do we know God's way? We have God's word. Amen? Praise God. God tells all of us who have been saved and redeemed by the perfect sacrifice of Christ that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. It is not about us. It is about God receiving what is due his holy name. Every ounce of worship that you give God, he deserves. And every amount of worship that you withhold, he also deserves. We as the priests of God, we can't be a part in offering strange fire to the Lord. We have to worship according to God's word. We must offer our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. That's why we gather, and that's why we sing, and that's why we pray, and that's why we dance, because that's what God's word tells us to do. And this is the ultimate mark for us. Jesus Christ is the way. How do we truly worship God in spirit? We worship by being saved and redeemed by Jesus. He's the way. He is the truth and he is the life. Anything that brings attention to me and doesn't bring everyone's attention to God, strange fire. Better worship according to his word because it's not about us. It's all about him. Point number two, abiding in the spirit. Moses told Aaron and his other sons in verse seven, you must not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting or you will die for the Lord's anointing oil is on you. And so they did as Moses said. They had to stay in God's presence. They could not leave. They had to stay there. They couldn't go out because God's holiness demanded their total undivided hearts and their undivided attention. And God said, until this period of worship is over, you don't move. Man, that kind of puts them in perspective how serious God is about his holiness. We as the redeemed priests of God, you have to understand something. You're just not anointed temporarily. You're not just anointed on Sunday from 830 to 930. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. He is dwelling you and he is living in you and he sees everything you do and he goes everywhere you go we have to have a holy posture for us abiding is not remaining in a geographical place it is about the posture of our hearts and all the activities of our lives i had to try and abide in the spirit when the cowboys laid down a couple weeks ago there were things I could not say. I could not smash my TV. I couldn't cuss Mike McCarthy. I had to sit there and say, oh, well, it's just a game and it's over. God, I'm going to get back to worshiping you. Amen. Now, y'all know that that's exactly what I did. Praise God. <laughs> Is there any fire coming out from anywhere? The first key to abiding is a obeying commandment one. Don't make the same mistake they did. Commandment number one, you remember, you shall have no other gods before me. Worshiping and abiding in the Spirit is to worship in the Spirit and have no other gods. No other kind of spiritism in our lives. No of this New Age nonsense. None of this neo-spiritual, hyper-charismatic stuff. 
No, we worship in spirit. We were directed and led and surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Everything is directed by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings all attention to Jesus. Jesus told us in John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak whatever He hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. And Jesus says He will glorify Jesus because He will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus is saying anything that the Holy Holy Spirit does it's a direct resemblance and it's a direct reflection back to Jesus Christ he doesn't act on his own he doesn't bring any attention to himself it's everything directed to Christ the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ and he takes from Jesus what is Jesus and he declares it to us and and he is what embodies us he, the Holy Spirit regenerates us and indwells us so that we have the person of Christ in us we should remember that at 11.30 at night when we think everybody else is asleep. And we should remember that when somebody asks, leans over and asks us, well, hey, did you see this about so-and-so? You should remember the Holy Spirit is listening to that conversation. We must have our minds, we must have our hearts and our wills set on God so that our thoughts and our, emo and our emotions and our actions are led by the Spirit of God. There can't be any other kind in our lives. How do you know if I, how do I know if I'm abiding? It's simple. Look at the fruit. Jesus said this, you will know them by their fruits. In other words, what's the result of your life? What's the result of the conversation? You can read Galatians chapter 5, and I'll read Galatians 5, 16, which says, I say then walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Well, listen, what's the fruit? What's the outcome of the conversation? Did you mar somebody else's image to somebody else? Well, that's not, that's not the work of the Spirit. That's, that, that sounds more like the devil to me. That sounds more like the enemy. I mean, did it, did it lead you to obedience? Is it, is it producing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control? Or is it leading other people away from God's service? Well, you have to, you, you, if you're not abiding in the Spirit, you won't be producing the fruit of the Spirit. We abide in the Spirit. Here's, here's, listen, here's a no-brainer. You abide in the Spirit by abiding in the Word. I hear these super spiritual people all the time talking about the Holy Spirit said this and the Holy Spirit said that, and I don't hear them say one piece of Scripture. Well, if, if the Holy Spirit didn't say something from here to you, it probably wasn't the Holy Spirit talking to you. And that's why we, the most important gift of the Spirit ain't prophecy and it ain't tongues, in my opinion. We need the discerning of spirits. So that you can know, not everybody that comes and says, I have a word from God, is walking in the Spirit. False teachers, false prophets have gone out to deceive many. Jesus said if possible in the last days, they would even deceive the elect of God. And we're arrogant enough to think, oh, I'll just, I'll, I'll just read a little extra. I'll just read the verse today. Or I'll just see what Pastor DJ, you better start abiding in the word of God. Y'all don't want to hear this. Colossians chapter 3. So let me practice what I just preached and give you some scripture. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Oh, I love that. Well, a synonym, the word abide, in you richly. It means that you, if you had to give a loan, you would have plenty to give out and then more to keep yourself on the holy path. Come on, somebody. I can, I, I don't even have to give you a loan, praise God. I can give you a gift. Here's what God's word says. Well, I just don't know. He just seems so, oh my goodness, he just seems so perfect. Oh, and he's so dreamy. And oh, he took me to my favorite. Uh, does he love Jesus? Well, there, you don't need to finish that sentence. Well, you know, I think he went to church when he was little. And listen, that don't mean he can go to church and he can still be a son of the devil. I'm not saying that. Don't mishear me. But what I'm telling you is this. When you are dwelling and abiding in the Word of God, it comes out of you. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Oh, I love that. In all of heavenly wisdom. Singing psalms and hymns, praise God, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart. 
to God. We abide in the Spirit by abiding in the Word. We abide in the Spirit by worshiping and praising God. Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Are you breathing? Look at your neighbor right now and say, are you breathing? Shake them. Some of them are falling asleep. Turn around in the back and smack a couple of them. Are you breathing? You got breath in your lungs? Then you are, then let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Think about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. It says about midnight, they're locked up in their chain for doing the right thing, falsely beat, wrongfully beaten and imprisoned and thrown in prison. And it doesn't say the first call that they made wasn't to their lawyer. It was to their heavenly father. And it says about midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God and all the prisoners were listening to them. And lastly, we abide in the Spirit. By relying, and this is so important, and we could preach 10 messages on just this, just this. Abiding in the Spirit means relying on the Spirit's power instead. Philippians 3.3, 3, we are the circumcision. We are God's chosen people, saved by grace through faith, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And when we abide... We agree, and when our lives are in agreement, then we can apply the truth, point number three. See, it wasn't enough for the priests to merely teach the people the difference between the holy and the common. They had to live it. See, handling a corpse made you unclean. Priests were never to touch a corpse because it made you unclean. And so Aaron and his other sons and the other priests, they they had to stay in the tent of meeting. They had to apply the truth. They had to live it. And Aaron had to live it as a grieving father. Aaron had to live it as a man. Have you ever been mad at God because you're trying to follow God and you lose someone you love? You ever been in church and you didn't? It was the last place on earth that you wanted to be, but you went because you knew you should? Well, Aaron the priest can relate to you. His son dies. His sons die. And he's not even allowed to mourn. He has to stay and he has to continue performing his duties before God. Why? Because God told him, you must distinguish between the holy and the common, the clean and the unclean, and teach the Israelites all the statutes that the Lord has given to them through Moses. We've got to live the truth, even when it's inconvenient, and especially when it's uncomfortable. We've got to do that. When we're in the worst, most trying seasons of our life, when we worship in truth, it means that we are sincere and genuine before God. We're not just worshiping according to rituals or religious traditions. Well, our hearts are, our heart's desire is to fully please God and to be in His presence. We want to be there. We want to be with Him. And we want to apply the truth. It means that we are seeking Him. We're not not just seeking an emotional experience or a certain kind of manifestation, but we're coming before God because we want Him and we want His truth to rule in our hearts and in our lives. It means that when we worship in truth, we're real with God. And I love that because if you read if you read all the way through to verse 19, and I was going to this morning, but I just didn't think I could get through it. But you see what Aaron does at the very end. He fasts. Instead of partaking in the offering with the other priests, he fasts and God accepts it. And you know what Aaron says? Aaron says this, I knew if I would have partaken of this sacrifice, it wouldn't have glorified God. God would not have been pleased with Aaron just going through the motions. So God says he can't mourn. He can't rip his garments. He can't put ashes and sackcloth on. But what does he do? He says, I'll fast because that's what's acceptable to God. And he still grieves and he still serves and he's real with God and God blesses him. This morning, for many of us, it's time to get real with God. For many of us, if we're honest, this is just what we do on Sunday when we don't have anything else to do. When it fits our family calendar. Well, it's today is a Sunday we can make it. Well, praise God, you can make it. I'm sure glad Jesus made it to the cross, aren't you? I mean, that was pretty uncomfortable. And listen, life happens. And there's times when we have to be real. And there may be times in your life where you're like, look, I cannot fake it today. I just got to get along with God. I gotta go take a walk in the woods. I gotta go sit in a tree stand. I gotta go, I gotta go sit by a body of water, and my soul just just has to, I just gotta receive. And listen, you have to do that. But listen to this also. Don't forget you are still a priest before your God. You're still a priest. We're a nation of priests. 
when we worship in, in applying the truth, we don't try to cover up our sin, we confess our sin. I love that. We don't cover it up. We're not acting. We're not putting on a front. We're not wearing a, a, a spiritual mask to try to look the part. No, we come to God with open hearts and say, Lord, I'm going to make every effort to apply your word. And Lord, I know I'm going to mess up, but when I do, I'm confessing to you and I'm going to come right back to you. I'm going to come right back to you and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try to I'm going to fight as hard against my sin as you fought for me on the cross. You ever made a commitment like that to God? Or you just, whenever it comes along and it's convenient, you just say, well, gosh, you know, I've been doing so good lately. I, I'll get it right on Sunday. You, you, you better get it right now. And then here's the thing. A dead indicator for you is if you know it is wrong, that is a clear sign that you should not do it. And the Holy Spirit is in you saying, I, I, I don't know about it. Hey, listen, 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 listen. Oh, you stop for a second. My flesh needs this. We don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Go to Acts. Man, go all the fast forward to the New Testament. Applying the truth means we, we don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira saw Barnabas sell a piece of land, and they saw the recognition that he got from the people, and they thought, well, it would really be nice to get that kind of attaboy in front of the church. And so they sell a piece of land, and then they lie about how much it was. And Ananias, come, and the man comes in, and he says, this is all of it, and we're giving it all to the Lord. And Peter says, you're lying to the Holy Spirit, and he drops dead right where he stood. And then his wife comes in later, and she lies. She drops dead right where she stood, and deacons had to usher him out. Praise God. Can you imagine having to do that as a deacon in the church today? Well, what happened? We have to call the rescue squad. Why? Well, sister so-and-so lied to the Holy Spirit. That's New Testament. God is serious about his people, about us being a holy people. And, and here's the thing. We are accountable when the warning has been given. Because God receives glory when he exercises his mercy. God also receives glory when he exercises his judgment. You don't believe me? Well, read the whole, read Revelation. Revelation is about God unleashing his wrath on a world that has defied him. And you look through the whole book of Revelation, God takes away every convenience, every luxury, and everything that mankind has put their trust in besides him. What you should do today is be real with God. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we're overwhelmed with grief. And we're overwhelmed with sorrow. And we, we're overwhelmed with the prayer. That is the time when we come to him and we say, Lord, I need you now. Lord, I can't pretend. Lord, I don't understand. Lord, I'm angry that I'm in this situation. But Lord, I know that you're good even when and especially when your ways are not understood and I'm coming to you now because I need you. As the worship team comes, how do we get it right this morning? Nadab and Abihu were the wrong people. We've got to make sure this morning we're the right people. First Peter says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's use the right instruments. Hebrews chapter 13 says, therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of our lips that confess his name. Let's do it at the right time. Psalm 118 says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let's do it under the right authority. Jesus told Satan, it is written, you should worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. And let's do it with holy fire. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. One question, is your life offering genuine worship to God this morning? The thing is, is only you know. I, I can't judge. I, I can't look at your life. I, can't, I don't know what you're going. I don't know the ins and the outs, but God does, and you know. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that all of us this morning would offer genuine worship to you.
Lord, I pray during this time, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as Savior, if they've never given their life to Jesus Christ, I pray this morning you will convict them so that they can become one of your people. Lord, I pray for those of us who have just been going through the motions, just been showing up to show off, to see our friends, and then to go about our business, I pray, put a holy desire in our hearts. Convict us and draw us to yourself and remind all of us this morning, Lord, Remind us all of your goodness and may your goodness and your mercy inspire us to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to come, this, this, this altar is open. Let's stand together and sing.
Oh, He's been so good to us. His grace is so amazing. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for the new covenant that you instituted and sealed with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the sending of the Holy Spirit. We just ask that you help us, Lord. We want to offer genuine worship. We want to offer holy fire to you. We want our lives to be filled and marked by your presence. So, Lord, I just pray you give us the grace as we go. Help us, O God to distinguish between the holy and the common, the clean and the unclean in our lives, to surrender and listen to your voice so that we can live our lives as holy and pleasing sacrifices because you are worthy of nothing less. You are worthy of all we can do and more. Give us the grace to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Go and live as a holy fire.